Hey everyone, welcome to this video on SI units and unit conversion. So these basics videos go over some things that you'll be using a lot in physics. For some of you, these videos might be the first time you're learning something, and for some of you, it might just be a refresher. But either way, I would definitely recommend watching the basics videos because it'll make the rest of physics a lot easier. So in this video, we're gonna talk about units and why they're important. We'll cover the seven SI units and which ones we'll use the most. And finally, we'll learn how to convert between units. All right, so let's start with units. So what do we mean by a unit? Well, a unit is just a way to define a specific amount of something. So we all use units every day to describe different things. When we measure or talk about length or distance, we might use centimeters, inches, feet, or miles. For time, we might use seconds, minutes, or hours. For temperature, we could use degrees Fahrenheit or degrees Celsius. For volume, we might use ounces or cups, or we might use liters. And even for money, we might use different units like dollars and cents. And notice that almost every unit we use will also have an abbreviation as a shorter way to write that unit. We can also combine units to form new units. Like when we measure speed in miles per hour or kilometers per hour, we're combining a unit of distance and time to make a unit for speed. We also might measure our car's fuel efficiency in miles per gallon or kilometers per liter, and we measure our heart rate in beats per minute. So when units show up in a sentence or a physics problem, we'll see that the number or the value is followed by the unit. And we might use the full word to describe the unit, or we might use the abbreviation. So you've probably been told before to always keep track of your units. So why are units important? Well, the 1999 Mars Climate Orbiter failure is a pretty good example. The Mars Climate Orbiter was a space probe made by the American aerospace company Lockheed Martin and launched by NASA with the goal of orbiting Mars in order to study the Martian climate and atmosphere. The probe was supposed to orbit Mars high above its atmosphere and study the planet. But on September 23, 1999, NASA lost communications with the probe. What they discovered was that the trajectory of the space probe had been wrong. It got much closer to the surface of Mars than they wanted, and the probe probably burned up in the atmosphere. It wasn't clear why the trajectory had been off, but eventually they found the root cause. The issue was with the software that was used to make calculations in order to control the space probe. And one piece of software from Lockheed Martin that sent data to software used by NASA caused the problem. The reason was that the two pieces of software were using different units. The short version is Lockheed Martin was sending numbers in units of pound force, which is a US customary unit, but NASA was expecting them to be in newtons, which is a metric unit. One pound force equals 4.45 newtons, so NASA sent instructions to the orbiter that were off by a factor of 4.45. This caused the orbiter's trajectory to be way off and eventually enter the atmosphere and probably burn up or crash. The lesson here is that it's true. Always keep track of your units. If you have a number on your paper with no units, it could be anything, and your answer might be way off. The Mars Climate Orbiter example also shows how hard it is to communicate between different teams when you're using different systems of units. And that leads us into SI units or the International System of Units, which is a set of units that everyone in the world can agree to use, and we'll mostly be using these units in physics. So there are seven important base SI units. The unit for length or distance is meters, abbreviated lowercase m. For mass, it's kilograms, or lowercase kg. For time, it's seconds, or lowercase s. For temperature, we use Kelvin, abbreviated capital K. For amount of substance, we use moles, or MOL for short. For electrical current, we use amperes, commonly referred to as amps, also abbreviated as capital A. And for light intensity, we use candelas, abbreviated CD. You're really only going to use the first four units in physics class, and you'll use moles in chemistry. So these are the base units, and just like we mentioned before, you can combine these base SI units to form other SI units. For example, the SI unit for speed or velocity is meters per second, combining the units for length and time. The SI unit for volume is cubic meters. For density, it's kilograms per cubic meter. 
And for newtons, which is the SI unit for force, we use kilogram meters per second squared. So we'll be using a lot of different units in physics, but you'll find that pretty much all of them are made by combining the same three or four base SI units. All right, so next, let's talk about converting between different units. So what do we mean exactly when we talk about converting between units? Well, we mentioned before how we can use different units to describe or measure the same thing. For example, we can use a ruler to measure the length of this book in inches, or we can measure the length in centimeters. In this case, the book is 9 inches, or 22.9 centimeters rounded up. Both of these are correct, because 9 inches equals 22.9 centimeters. We're just using two different units, inches and centimeters, to describe the exact same length. And either one is fine to use, but there are a bunch of reasons why we'll want to convert from one unit to a different unit. For example, if we wanted to add two lengths together. What is 4 inches plus 15 centimeters? Well, the answer is probably most useful if we give it in terms of a single unit. So we have two options here. We could convert the 15 centimeters into inches and get 5.9 inches. And then we add the 4 inches plus 5.9 inches equals 9.9 inches. Or we could convert the 4 inches to centimeters and we get 10.2 centimeters. Then we can add 10.2 centimeters plus 15 centimeters equals 25.2 centimeters. And both of these answers are correct, because 9.9 .9 inches equals 25.2 centimeters. They're just in different units. The big thing here is that we can't do math with these two numbers if they're in different units, and that's the biggest reason we're going to have to convert between different units. So first, we need to establish something that might seem obvious, but we can sometimes forget when we're solving a problem. And that is that we can only convert between units that represent the same thing or the same physical quantity. The physical quantity of time has different units like seconds, minutes, or hours, so we can convert between units of time. For example, 60 seconds of time equals one minute of time. But we can't convert units of time into units of temperature. No amount of seconds equals some amount of degrees Fahrenheit. Again, this might seem obvious, but we need to keep this in mind when we're using physics equations with different units. Okay, so how do we actually convert between units? Well first, there are different ways that we can write a relationship between units. For example, we could write 60 seconds equals 1 minute, or 1 minute equals 60 seconds. But we're actually going to find it easier to write these relationships as fractions, like this. We could think of it as saying 60 seconds per minute, or 1 minute per 60 seconds. Both are saying the same thing. Alright, so let's walk through an example. How many seconds are in a day? That's the same thing as saying, convert one day into units of seconds. So first, in order to convert between units, you need to know what the relationships are between the units that you're working with. You might know these off the top of your head, or they might be given to you. In our case, we know that 60 seconds equals one minute, 60 minutes equals one hour, and 24 hours equals one day. Next, we're going to write the amount that we start with. We're starting with one day and converting to seconds, so in our case, our starting amount is one day. Next, we're going to multiply by those unit relationships that we know, which are the amounts of each unit that are equal to each other. We have 24 hours per one day, 60 minutes per one hour, and 60 seconds per one minute. And again, these are all multiplied together. Now, we mentioned that we could write these relationships either way. For example, 24 hours per one day, or one day per 24 hours. So how do we know which way to write it? How do we know which one goes on top when we're writing these fractions? Well, here's the thing. We're going to multiply these fractions. So if we have the same unit on the top and the bottom of this list of fractions, then they cancel each other out, and we can cross them both out. So we have day on the top and on the bottom, so we can cross them both out. We can do the same for hours and minutes. The only unit that we haven't crossed out is seconds, and that's the unit we want our answer to be in. So there's the answer to our question. When we write these relationships, or equal amounts, we put the right one on the top or bottom so that we can cross units out and end up with only the unit that we want. So now that we've crossed out our units and found that we're only left with the unit we want, seconds, we know we wrote everything down correctly. 
Next, all we have to do is multiply these fractions to get our answer. We do that by multiplying all of the numbers on top, which gives us our top number or numerator, and then multiplying all of the numbers on the bottom, which gives us our bottom number or denominator. In our case, on the top we multiply 1 times 24 times 60 times 60 seconds, and we get 86,400 seconds. And on the bottom we multiply 1 by 1 by 1, and we get 1. And since any number divided by 1 is just that number itself, we can just ignore the 1 on the bottom since it doesn't have a unit. And there's our answer. 1 day is equal to 86,400 seconds. We could also say that there's 86,400 seconds per day. So this method of converting between units is called dimensional analysis. And even for really simple conversions, I always use this method so that I know everything is organized and I won't mess up and accidentally multiply when I should have divided or something like that. Let's try one more example. Let's convert 25 miles per hour to kilometers per hour. First, we need to know the relationships between the units that we're dealing with. And in this case, we're given that one kilometer equals 0.62 miles. Next, we write our starting amount, which is 25 miles per hour. Notice how miles per hour was written as MPH, but now we have 25 miles per one hour. Whenever we convert between units, we need to write them out completely as fractions. Next, we write out the equal amounts, or the relationship between units. And since we have miles on top already, and we want to cross miles out and only end up with kilometers, we're going to write our unit relationship, our equal amount, with miles on the bottom. Now, we can cross out miles, since it's on the top and the bottom. What we're left with is kilometers on the top and hours on the bottom, which is the unit we want, kilometers per hour. To get our answer, we just multiply the top numbers, 25 times 1 kilometer equals 25 kilometers, and then the bottom, 1 hour times 0.62 equals 0.62 hours. So we end up with 25 miles per hour is equal to 25 kilometers divided by 0.62 hours, which is true, but what we really want is kilometers per 1 hour. So to do that, we just finish the math. We'll do 25 divided by 0 0.62, and we get 40.3. So we write that on top. So our final answer is 40.3 kilometers per hour. So that's how we convert between units. All right, so let's recap. First off, we learned that units are important to keep track of. You might crash a $193 million space orbiter, or you might just get the wrong answer on a test, but let's not risk it. Next, we covered the seven base SI units. We also know that we can combine those units to form other units. Next, we learned how to convert a number from one unit to a different unit using a method we call dimensional analysis. All right, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.